I have the pleasure to announce Robert Senftleben. He is um, interested in ecolog ecological restoration for two to three years now. And uh, he's here today to tell us about his work in ecolog ecological restoration. Sorry. Um, and yeah, please give him a big round of applause and say welcome. Thanks. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm a bit nervous. It's uh, my first time I'm doing a speech about this topic and um, in front of so many people and chairs and in such a big room. So uh, bear over with me if I have to uh, look up or down or just think for 10 seconds to uh, get a hold of it again. So first I would like just to say a couple of words about myself and who I am and perhaps how I ended at uh, the Chaos Community Camp at this place today. So uh, I'm born on a small island in Denmark by um, a German dad and a Danish mama. You can also Deutsch sprechen, but I think there are a few people in Jordanian die, um, that are very excited and uh, saying hello and uh, Hello, uh, Jordania, and uh, hello, friends over there. So, um, yes, well, uh, I'm a guy who looked into a lot of things uh, since a young age, and I guess I'm not alone in this uh, space when it comes to questioning things and looking into how society and how our systems work and what we're doing and what it brings with it and so on. Um, so a couple of years <clears throat> ago, I, when I finished uh, my high school, I decided to go on a bicycle journey to explore a bit more. So I did a small bicycle journey from Denmark to India, which uh, promoted certain things in me, like uh, mobility, it uh, makes you uh, culturally sensitive, it gives a great... Um, uh, view on how things are going other places and you get very close to different environments and cultures and so on and so forth. Uh, when I came back, I ended in a place that is called Institute for X. So this is a... Um, This is a place, I'm not going to go away from the terraforming, but I think some of the background knowledge is, is interesting to know, to understand how um, I ended up where I did and why. So this is a place in Aarhus, it's called the uh, Institute for X. Uh, some might call it a, a hacker space, some will call it a, a platform for culture, for music, for business, for environment, for cultural things and social things and so on and so forth. Here I learned a great deal about mobility and about collaboration, about how to uh, mix many ideas and how to make it all happen. Uh, simultaneously with me being present at this uh, place, I went on a school that is called the Chaos Pilots, which is a school that engaged with creative business development, project management, leadership, and process design and process leadership. So this is my professional background with which I'm engaging in the work and the issue that we are going to talk about right now. So, um, I got scoped in on the topic of terraforming and ecological restoration and what it can lead, uh, what it leads along with uh, Jani, uh, the feedback loop of the action. What happens when, when you do it? When I ended up at a conference in Sweden uh, two years and a little bit, um, oops, originally I went there with the focus and interest uh, because I was campaigning against Monsanto and arranging some conferences uh, a couple of times, so I went to the Summer of Soils where these and other topics are discussed. But at the Summer of Soils I met a very particular uh, man whose name is John Dennis Liu, 
who has been studying and documenting terraforming and ecological restoration for the last 30 years. Um, and he is coming with a background as a journalist, as a soil scientist, environmentalist, has a, has a master in music and art. So he comes from a very wide, um, you may say, creative education and background that makes it able to, to view things from a very wide perspective. <clears throat> So I met this guy who was telling about ecological restoration, about terraforming, uh, political issues, social issues, environmental issues, ethical issues, when it comes to land use and property rights and the way we do agriculture or how we uh, produce and extract from the soil. So to give you a better in, uh, view on who this guy is and what this work is about and what I would say the most modern type of ecological restoration or terraforming or ecological regeneration um, is I want to show you uh, just three minutes of uh, one of John's many films. I think we have a sound problem. Yes, there's only one input. I'm very sorry for this. But I think we're going to be right there. No, you don't get anything here? Mm. Yes. What happens if I just... What? Sorry? Ah, just talk about it. Well, so here you see uh, John Dennis Liu. This is in 1995. He went to an area called the Lus Plateau. Uh, and this place you can see on these uh, pictures here, it is this, this area that they engaged in is the size of just a tiny bit smaller than Holland. Bigger than Belgium and a little bit smaller than Holland. Uh, what you see here is probably the most modern day way of terraforming and improving ecological function that we have um, done in, in, well, in this century. The, the Americans under the Great Depression, they actually did huge similar projects you can look at in, in around the 1930s, right? Uh, but uh, this is uh, just about now that this happened. So, sorry. Should I maybe um, put the sound down here first? Strange, huh? Well, anyway, so what you see here, uh, now he's telling about how we can enhance uh, food, water, life quality, uh, economics, ecology, and of course health if we uh, enhance the quality of the soil. So what you see there is a completely degraded ecosystem where basically all uh, microbial life in the soil is, is eradicated or, or dead. Um, yeah, I wish that John, he could have introduced this to you because he does have better skills and knowledge in this subject. So the picture you see here is, is the change that has happened eight years after they started the rehabilitation of the soil. Uh, in a couple of minutes I'm going to explain you some of the techniques and uh, give you some illustrations. Uh, but till then, is it, this is sound is finished, huh? 
Ah, it was working fine in my headset earlier. It's very loud almost. I think there's anything there? No? Well, the illustrations tell us a lot. So the basic, the basic issue when, when you have degraded or we have degraded a piece of land is that we have destroyed this life that exists uh, within the soil. All these small helpers from the bacteria to the protozoa to the, especially the earthworms are there to make sure that this planet of ours can host the life of ours. What happens, uh, for example, in the Luz Plateau for around eight, nine hundred years ago was that the civilization that once was uh, breeding and developing at this place simply overused and overproduced and overextracted what was there. So that means taking the trees down, uh, putting too much, much animals out, and in the end you will not have any uh, vegetation or green organic life in the soil. And into a green and fertile one, renowned for floods, mudslides, and famine. But with the fanfare comes the hope of change for the better. My name is John D. Liu. I've been documenting the changes on the plateau for 15 years. I first came here in 1995 to film an ambitious project where local people were constructing a new landscape on a vast scale. Transforming a barren land into a green and fertile one. The project certainly changed my life, convincing me to become a soil scientist. The lessons I've learned in the last few years have made me realize that many of the human tragedies that we regularly witness around the world, the floods, mudslides, droughts, and famines, are not inevitable. Here on the Luz Plateau, I've witnessed that people can lift themselves out of poverty. They can radically improve their environment. And by doing so, reduce the threat of climate change. One thing that became apparent early on is the connection between damaged environments and human poverty. In many parts of the world, there's been a vicious cycle. Continuous use of the land has led to subsistence agriculture. And generation by generation, this has further degraded the soils. The vital question we have to ask is, can this destructive process be reversed? When I first filmed Mr. Ta Fu Yuan and his colleagues back in 1995, I had no idea this initiative could achieve such dramatic results. into terraces has resulted in a marked increase in agricultural productivity. The higher yields are directly related to the return of natural vegetation in the surrounding ecological land. Okay, so it worked. So, 
How does it happen that it comes from the green state to the rather desertified and desert state? It was what I was just getting into uh, slightly before. The main issue, well, you, we all know it, chop and drop, overgrazing, and, um, well, chemical use uh, kind of uh, puts the, the dot over the eye when we start to use artificial fertilizer and pesticide and herbicide, we reach, so to say, a complete uh, destruction of the soils and thereby the foundation for the natural systems. So the issue is uh, quite known and if you take a quick look on one of uh, NASA's latest photos from our dear planet Earth, it's easy to see that around a quarter up to a third of our planet has reached a state of desertification. If you now take a look on the areas that are most desertified and you think where are all the major conflicts happening right now, where is it that we see huge, um, how do you call it, huge crowds of uh, migration and civil war and famines. It is in the areas where the ecological systems are extremely degraded. So many incidents and many events have shown the linkage, linkage between ecological degradation and economical and social issues going on in these areas and countries. So, what do we do about it? Here is a photo from an area called Al Muakka in Jordan, around 40 minutes from the capital Amman, where we are going to launch the first uh, project and as you can see, the state is severe. There's not much vegetation left. So one of the main issues when you have reached this state of soil is that the water does not penetrate into the soil any longer. And when this has happened, it's very difficult, of course, to get anything to grow there. It's a rather simple science and simple biology. And the solution is as simple. So. We are following in RISO some of the mythology and some of the work that is being introduced by permaculture, which was developed by Bill Mollison. And one of the techniques that we use is simply to make what is called swales into the soil to make the water infiltrate. So the problem is water does not infiltrate, so we must make the water infiltrate in one way or the other. And the simple technique is simple to either use excavator or, as you saw in the movie, engage millions or hundreds of thousands of people in the work to start to rehabilitate their area and thereby improve their life. But when you have made the first uh, <laughs> holes in the soil, you need to cover it to protect from the sun and to make sure that it gets new organic matter because organic matter is the direct feed or food for the microbial life. And if the microbial life in the soil does not get what it needs, it will not support the functionality of the soil. So actually the work starts underground. It is the underground that basically keeps the upper ground alive. So if we do not manage to feed and protect this life under the earth, it will not make it able to create a soil structure that is moisture enough, has enough, or has a certain pH, and has the life forms enough for the root systems and the plants and so on to go on and, and, and sustain itself, but also sustain the microbial life. Because they have an interlinked uh, life and they have an interlinked relation, the microbial life and the root systems and the plants. They benefit from each other and one cannot go without the other. Right? So, this is task number one. It's to realize the microbial life. So again, the underground sustains the upper ground or the top. And uh, 
and this is uh, done uh, well with the with the, the the earthwork and of course to catch the rain for the water to get in but then it needs to be covered with organic matter which can be everything from leaves to trees to biosolids which is the nice word for human uh, feces which can be prepared so it's not full of uh, parasites or any uh, intoxication for humans to eat later from products so that comes out of the functionality of the ecosystem and of course, animal manure, you can use newspapers and, and many other materials. So one of the big tasks we have in Jordan, because it's already very dry and it's in a lack of what you call biomass or necromass, which means, um, boom, 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 which is basically dead organic matter. This we need to collect to spread it out for the earth and the water and the biomass again to create the microbial life to a certain level so that it again can host uh, trees, vegetation, and so on and so forth. Um, an approach that is introduced by John is that you look at functionality of ecosystems. So when it comes to these projects and this work, traditionally um, development agencies and uh, aid agencies have been focusing when they do these projects on, on, on producing food straight away. So you, so you make an analysis, you find out what, what the need is in the community, you look at the habits, you look at the traditions, and so on and so forth, and you decide on a certain amount of crops. We want to introduce a new approach where the focus is on functionality. So rather looking at food production straight away, it is important to look at the functionality. So there are a lot of trees, they will not produce any food for us humans, but their function in the ecosystems is to provide enormous amounts of nutrition for the life underground. So, we are talking about rather uh, complex plant systems that will be introduced. And all of this you can read about in uh, permaculture. A very good book to, uh, how do you call it? I can uh, suggest you. It's called uh, The Designer's Manual. And it's by Bill Mollison. Is it with one L or two L? No, oh, it's like this. So he has over many years, Bill Mollison, uh, explained and observed how every kind of climate works to uh, its best functionality, basically. And there is really a lot of knowledge to get there. So, after the basic earth work is done, here I just want to show you a small um, illustration. So, RISO is a foundation that is being set up at the moment. Maybe I should get you, give you a small uh, update about where we are at the moment with this work and um, how it's looking at the moment. So, at present we are setting up a foundation in Holland with the name RISO Foundation. RISO comes from Greek and means to strike root. And RISO, the prefix is known from the word rhizobium, which is tiny root structures that come out of the, root, uh, the roots and function as kind of support channels underground and build the way through the soil for air and water and energy and small microbial life to pass through. So what we are intending to do is we are going to move the so-called RISO camp out to designated areas. In this particular case, it's in Jordan at the picture I showed you just before. And we are setting up a mobile unit consisting of nomadic houses, which in the case of Jordan probably will be traditional Bedouin houses. And then we are working with a couple of designers to design uh, upcycled shipping containers, 40-foot upcycled shipping containers to host research facilities in ecological restoration or terraforming, training facilities, in, uh, facilities to innovate in products and tools and different ways to, to do the work, but also to be able to have a good produce after, because there comes a time after when the ecosystems are well functioning, it's able, we are able to start to think about, so 
how do we maintain the ecosystems now and what do we want to use of it and to what degree in order not to um, how can you say degrade the ecosystem again because the basic aim is that we must make sure in this work always to have an increase in biodiversity so um, I, I assume most of you know what biodiversity means but for the ones not it means the the amount of difference of life forms both in fauna and flora that exists in an ecological system. So it's important that the framework and the work that is being done and how the system is being used after it's going to be restored is in a pace and in a way that will not degrade the ecosystem once again later on. So, um, and a huge part of our work is going to take part in make sure that these communities that we're going to work with and ourselves will make sure that we somehow have a guideline. These are, these are still very new things and these are things that are not, how can I say, um, we, are not, uh, we are at the beginning. We are at the beginning of this work and it's still a process of deciding do we go this way or do we go a bit both ways and meet over here. Um, so, and this is uh, perhaps what still makes it very interesting also for many people. So, after point one, point one, collaborative need assessment with local population. So, from day one that we settled the camp with the setup, there will be open facilities. Oh, yeah, uh, to finish about the facilities. After research and innovation, there's going to be facilities for uh, a wood workshop metal workshop, electricity workshop, um, music for dance and for the culture to, to stay alive and again for people to be able actually to work and build and, and innovate. And uh, also we envision a very big uh, gathering space so we from day one can have people uh, staying there and working with them and collaborating and, and really creating well, how can I say, basically creating a community with the community in the community. So, we do not want to separate ourselves from the people that we work with. And we don't want to stay, let's say, in the capital. No, we want to, to, to be straight there at site every day, work side by side, uh, and both share the time and the space and not have this separation which you may see, for example, United Nations, when they go and do development aid, they, they build a small castle around uh, 5, 10, 20 kilometers away. At least this is how it has happened a lot of times traditionally. And so next step is to start to do the wa water harvesting. That's basically what I told you about with the earthwork. And uh, one thing is to catch and have enough for rainwater and for um, for watering the plants in the nurseries and in the soil. But another point is to, we must start to fill up the aquifers again. So in uh, the area where our pilot site is, where the um, picture where the white building was, they have now to, to dig around 200, 300 meters deep to find any water. And this area, it still rains between 100 and 150 millimeters. So if you, uh, calculate uh, 15 hectares. Our initial pilot site is 15 hectares uh, big. And if you calculate uh, 15 hectares with uh, 100 to 150 millimeters, uh, 100 to 150 millimeters of rainwater, you have a couple of million liters uh, of water. So if you can just catch a small percentage of this in, uh, in underground wells or with the rainwater collectors on top, we are already pretty good off. And Again, we must fill up the aquifers. Then we set up the Mobile Research Training and Innovation Center for Ecological Restoration. And next step at a certain point, so the two main points of the RISO camp is to, on one side, do the ecological restoration from day one, and on the other side, start to design and think to build a permanent center that will stay at the place. And from that process starts, we want to involve the local community and 
different people who may be interested, both globally and, uh, and nationally, to take over and run this permanent center. So we, in this way, can start to create a network globally of these centers and camps where this uh, innovation and work uh, is going to take place. Um, Well, I'm sorry to say that I was rather unprepared for today because my computer broke down in France some time ago and was first able to get a computer yesterday and I had to move a lot of stuff because on the 20th of September I'm moving myself to Jordan. So it's a bit, uh, it's a popping in and out a bit, the things, and a bit messy, but I hope you can follow and it makes sense to, uh, to some degree. <laughs> so here are the people we need to involve in this work. We need to involve both the educational level, we need to uh, involve research. At the moment we are establishing uh, collaborations with universities in Holland. Uh, some collaborations are established in Jordan. And the deal with this is to bring students in and lectures in for one, two or even three semesters to work with ecological restoration, but also to do master theses, PhDs and to do their research on this. Um, and the interest is huge. We are having many people every day that contact us from all around the world, asking how they can come, how they can take part. And this is going to be one of the key elements uh, in this work. Not only to make sure that there's hands to work, but also because this topic is still so new and there's so many, uh, how do you call it, there's so much we still do not know what happens when you apply this type of fertilizer for this land. What happens with the soil within what time period when you plant this tree. So there's a lot of things to learn about. Then there, we need to involve a lot of organizations. We need to involve corporations also. We need to involve culture and art and the creative scene. We need to have volunteers, we need to involve the government, and we need to involve politics, and we need to test a lot of things, we need to do a lot of things, and we need to work hard, because most of the places where you have the certified land, it's uh, funny enough, very warm and very hot, so it's, uh, you're gonna get brown and hot and warm and sweaty, but you feel great. So here's another picture of the land, where we're going to start the in initial uh, work. And here is another photo. Here we have a picture of me and one of the families of the Bedouins who live there. They are presently now grazing with around 600 animals. So. You can say that their animals are doing terraforming, uh, but perhaps unknowingly what the consequences are of it. And when we have been there a couple of times and talked with them about the project, they are super happy to take part and they are super happy to know what's going to happen. And what should... Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, sorry. Okay, I'm gonna freestyle a bit. So, um, I would like to read you this poem that was made by uh, by Arthur in Sweden at the, the Summer of Soils. Also, so every minute of our life. Every breath we take is made possible by the food we eat. Bread, vegetables, meat, and dairy products all come originally from crops that grow in the soil. Today we are seven billion people who share the planet. In 30 years time, planet Earth will have perhaps two to three billion more mouths to feed. We face the double challenge of at once feeding a rapidly growing population with sufficient amounts of wholesome nourishing food and economizing with finite resources in order to stop the depletion of the 
basis of all other resources, fertile soil and the plant life it sustains. It is the flow of energy from the sun that regenerates the planet's ecosystems and creates the renewable resources on which our existence depends. Agriculture and forestry imply production, but also cost custodianship of the basis for our existence. Arable fertile soil. The way we go about farming and forestry are crucial to the ecological future of the planet. Thus, they are matters of life and death. So, there are two things um, that there are too much of in the world at the moment. Uh, perhaps there's uh, several other things, but uh, in this matter there are two things that there are too much of. One is the certified land, which is not used and is standing passive and um, uh, to, to, to illustrate another point of when it comes to the certified land, so when it comes to, uh, uh, to climate change, uh, when you have a, a decertified land, the uh, sun's energy is not going to be used in its proper way, because uh, instead of it creating the photosynthesis with the vegetation, it leaves uh, the sun rays on the earth as heat, and uh, we increase the temperature of our planet. When you have trees or other types of vegetation, uh, the heat is transformed for energy, for the growth, and, uh, well, we are way better off uh, that way. So one thing is the empty land, and the other thing is an extent and uh, a huge amount of people who live in uh, bad and terrible situations uh, in starvation and political exile and refugees and so on. And um, yeah, it's uh, well, it's uh, shit. Now in Jordan, there are two and a half million Syrian refugees, and they live in tent camps where they are killing each other, and they are not allowed to go outside, and they are yeah. Well, it's fucked to say it in yeah. I know it's a bad language, but it's, uh, it's uh, this situation is uh, crazy and it keeps on shocking me how we can let these things be. I'm not talking to you as we, but as a humanity and as a species that shares basic everything on this earth. We share the joy, we share all the same organs, we know we share all feelings. Uh, research has shown that the dreams we have is basically the same if you are from Africa or here or there. and. It is uh, terrible that we have not yet uh, managed to combine this. And these are some of the efforts that we want to move towards. Uh, so we are at the moment discussing possibilities in Jordan to rehabilitate a piece of land which is 1,000 hectares big. Instead of a money exchange, the exchange would be land where we potentially can start to uh, grow and establish new communities for people who have no home and for people who have no property and who have lost everything in a war or civil war. But we might be able to uh, provide land and provide work and actually provide value for those people. And there has been done some projects in, in uh, Colombia, Los Gaviotos, perhaps somebody have heard about it, where after 20 years it was possible to increase the land value with, uh, th uh, what, what do you call it, uh, uh, by 30, by 30. So, um, it is extremely interesting if we are able to connect, uh, let's uh, just focus on refugees because this is where we have our focus in Jordan now. If we can get some of these people that we can start to, to cultivate and grow these communities where they actually can start to get a new heritage, a new, start new lives, and, and uh, because who knows how long they will stay, and most people uh, stay often in these countries where they go. So now uh, I have 20 minutes left, and I want to leave some time for 
questions and stuff like this. But I want to show uh, one more small clip uh, by a happy guy uh, from India who has grown. Uh, he has been growing, I think, some 500 or 800 hectare by himself. Well, and the help of villagers and family, but. And he has a few words to share about uh, his life and how he's feeling. And he, here he gives. Yes, I think uh, I'm going to open it up for questions and uh, a dialogue and perhaps some of the things I told was not so clear and you need to uh, bridge it or something like this. If you have questions, please line up at the microphones and for all the newcomers on the stream, please remember that um, translations are available via DEC extension 8011. Um, so, do we have any questions? Okay, left microphone, uh, right microphone. Um, do you know there is a lot of people uh, thinking about uh, the permaculture? And it's the same kind of the stuff you are doing. You know the permaculture? If I, I didn't get your first question, yes, I know about permaculture. And uh, what you are doing looks like some, so like some kind of uh, extreme permaculture, isn't it? Sorry, it's a bit unclear up here. Could you Sorry. say it one more time? Uh, what, what you are doing uh, looked like uh, some extreme permaculture. Yes. Isn't okay, now I got you. Yes, I mean, a lot of the, when it comes to the earthwork and working with the soil and the plants and these techniques are basically all from permaculture. Mm -hmm. You're right. Um, we want to extend it and, and bring the culture in and to make sure that the community um, um, well, how, how can you say it? That, that the, what we're really trying is to create, to, to mix the restoration work with, uh, how can you say it, with the spiritual work and cultural work. And many people who live in lands that are very desertified and it's a hostile life and it might, um, um, well, basically, we, we want to bring smiles in there and and really create a platform uh, that provides all the basic necessities and tools and machines and room for this to happen. And I still have one question. Um, do you have a website where you share the, um, your, uh, your techniques and stuff like that? Yes. Um, We have. Um, there is this block where the process of the work is uh, described and different project description. You can find our project plan and also some of the techniques. But if you want to see the techniques, I would like just to refer you here and to look under dry land. 
Okay. Dry land agriculture and permaculture, because this is basically where we get the knowledge from. Then there is a Facebook group also where the discussion is going on. Thank you. At the moment, we are setting up an official homepage and we are setting up the foundation and we are now at the moment setting up the fundraising uh, strategy. Okay, left microphone. Um, hello. Hi. Um, this sounds quite expensive um, and there is a lot of dry land. Uh, how do you think this idea is going to scale? So uh, it was, it's going to be expensive and then you said something I didn't hear. I mean, th there is a lot of dry land, decertified land, which ah. could be terraformed yes. and uh, that would be great, but how much do you think can you accomplish? Well, I think we can make the whole world green again if we bring enough people along and if we are able to make a setup that is so simple that we can replicate it quickly everywhere else. So the initial setup that we are looking at now, we have just made an establishment budget. It looks to be around 150, 170,000 euros. And this includes a space that will be able to host up to 100 people, 50 to 100 people, and electricity, water, uh, like I said, a functioning metal workshop, wood workshop. Uh, because we are not talking about the necessity of very high-tech, high-tech solutions. We are focusing on, on as low-tech as it can be without being super slow in the work. Okay, thank you. Okay, any more questions? Some of these questions are still a bit difficult to answer because we have not launched the pilot project yet. So we are in a design phase, we're in a thinking phase. We have the land, we have a fundraiser with a great experience. Uh, John D. Liu is on board as the project designer and initiator and uh, things are rolling. But there's a lot of uh, things to uh, think about. And my mind is also, um, how do you call it, rather because it's the uh, first time uh, uh, to work with a big task like this after finishing education this summer and uh, coordinating in Jordan, moving from Denmark and uh, uh, doing a, a new, uh, doing a talk for the first time and so, um, and it's the same, many of the people who are joining this process are students who are eager to, to work with this and, and know that there is um, a different way and a smarter way to do things and know about the issues. Okay. Um, we have a great dream uh, uh, in Raiso, and it is to create uh, the ring of uh, Ashtar. Uh, Ashtar is an Egyptian god of fertility, and the ring of Ashtar is basically a huge stripe uh, around the whole world where you will be able to walk and never need to visit a supermarket because the place is so beautifully grown with berries and fruit and vegetables and animals are running around freely and happy and you can camp at every side because you will find shade uh, wherever you go and you will find fresh food and fresh water. And when we have made uh, one around the world, we can make it on the other side and we can, we can make uh, many rounds and in, in the end it's all uh, encapsulated. And we are actually able to create what is described as paradise in the holy books. It's not far away. The pictures you saw from China was a difference of uh, eight years. So you can imagine ten years more. So most of us in this room will be able to see this change even. It's not a uh, grandchildren uh, accomplishment. Okay, next question. Over there. Over there. Yeah. Um, well, you show two examples of two uh, countries that are a bit top-down organized, China and Jordan. Um, but how do you um, engage other governments that, um, yeah, well, have a lot more to lose or um, are bit reluctant to go after these ideas. So your question was how do we engage other governments that are not... That are reluctant to these ideas. Uh, 
so at this point we have not engaged the government of Jordan and it's still going very fine. So the land we got, the 15 hectares, comes from Her Royal Highness Princess Basma bin Ali, who is connected to the Royal Botanic Garden in Jordan. You don't call that government. <laughs> Sorry? You don't call that government. I didn't hear it? it you said the Royal Highness. Yes. That sounds like government to me. Well, yeah, you're right. Well, in a way you're right and in a way you're not. Because, uh, well, I'm not sure that even the official government is so happy for all the work that she might do. So I think there exist people with a title that we look at as established, but who have extremely good and pure intentions with the work and uh, separate themselves as a person also. Okay, next question. Uh, hi. Hi. Uh, you showed us some pictures of people in Jordan and my question would be how did you actually get in touch with them and learn about what they want? So uh, we go out there and uh, when I go out there I need someone to translate. So there is a, a kind uh, friend of mine who go with me and the many first times we did not really uh, speak about much just walking together and have a coffee and talk about life and uh, Denmark and at some point you start to talk about the environment you're in and at some point uh, you start to hear their life story and what's going on and what is needed. Um, so my approach is a very slow and uh, a consistent contact and uh, we need to feel the readiness before we can do anything. And, um, well, it's the most sensitive point you touched upon, because if, uh, if we cannot manage to create trust, uh, there's no way to start anything. There's no reason for this. Um, now, when I go back in September, we are gonna go there weekly again and, um, like I told, we're, we're going to build up this RISO camp as an open hacker space. I think this is a good terminology at this place for everyone to come and take part in. So the local community will have access to everything that we have access to. They can go and sleep in our bed if, if they want to. All the tools, all the machines, all the equipment, all the internet, all the water, all the computers is, is open source, open access for everyone uh, to take part in. And we envision to uh, uh, arrange sport, recreational events, also cultural events, uh, music, um, yeah, to create more relationship basically, and also not to get stuck in this one particular topic. Okay, do we have another question? Yes, we do. Uh, hi, I don't hi? really have a question. I just want to say that I really admire your approach and your enthusiasm. Thanks a lot. Go ahead. As I understood it, right now you're only talking about restoration, right? So bringing back uh, the plants to areas where they have, got, have been uh, extinguished in the last, let's say, 100 or 1,000 years. But if I understood you right, the big plan is to transform the whole world. Don't you see any dangers that might arise when we do so, when we change in such big scale? Yeah, well, now that you ask me, I will think about it once more, but I have never seen any threats before. I cannot see uh, any negative uh, implications in having green areas instead of an area with uh, sand and uh, dryness where no life can uh, exist, basically. Yeah, I, I think in the first place that's absolutely right, but um, humanity has often tried to do big things and uh, did not know the, the consequences from the beginning. Yes. So I guess if we do a change in big scale, I, uh, I think the project in the beginning, in the pilot phase, is no danger. 
Sorry, the, the last sentence? I think the pilot phase is really no danger. But if you are going to, uh, let's say, transform the whole Sahara, uh, that's something that it has been there for maybe millions of years. I could think of uh, negative aspects that we do not incorporate right now. So yes. Yeah. Yes, I, uh, you're absolutely right. And uh, I'm not an oracle. And uh, I cannot uh, look in the future. And I, I don't know. Um, but the man-made deserts that we have made within the last couple of hundred years, maybe five, six hundred years, I think we would be way better off if we bring that back to a very well-functional uh, uh, state. Because uh, at the moment we are not able to we are not able to feed the people. Well, we are. We, we produce enough food that could feed everyone. I read and that we throw 40 percent out and stuff like this. But if you look at Chad or you look at uh, Rwanda before. Millions of people were, were were running away because their their trees and their crops and the vegetation was taken away and and destroyed within a century, and um, the effects of this uh, are very uh, obvious. I mean, many of the refugees who come to Europe now, they they all come from areas where ecological system have been broken down basically, and. Uh, some of them would probably love to be in Europe, <laughs> but I think most of them, they would like to go back to their home and to their homeland. But it would not make sense for them to go home now, because there's, there's nothing to go back to, basically. Uh, when you cannot uh, drink water in your area, you're really screwed. Uh, so, but I, I agree, I, there was another guy once, he was talking also about the Sahara, he also mentioned the Sahara. I, I don't know how it would change the, the global uh, ecology and... and, and uh, atmosphere and the elements and so on, if the Sahara became green, for example. I, I don't know. Okay. Thanks for we the have, considerations. We have uh, time for a last quick question. So, any takers? If not, then have another big round of applause for Robert, please. And uh, one last thing, uh, tomorrow at uh, 8 o'clock in the White Dome in the evening, uh, it would be fantastic if some people would like to join a discussion on how to move along with this and how we can, uh, so to say, strike root more places and how we can basically get further. I would like to give a more detailed uh, view on where this project is at the moment. Uh, and scope in on the kind of more pure practicalities and not talking so much about uh, ecosystem and functionality, but, but look more at the project and how to move along with it. Uh, so uh, please join for this or tell it to your friends or your neighbors or anything. So it's eight o'clock in the White Dome in the evening. Thank you.